best book written about the Emmett Till case, the murder that shocked the world and propelled the civil rights movement. Uh, Devery's book was the catalyst for the miniseries that was on ABC last January 6th, 13th, and 20th. And much of the uh, miniseries was uh, taken from research that Devery did. It took him over 10 years to write the book. And uh, he never personally met Mamie Till, Emmett's uh, mother, but he had six lengthy phone conversations with her and became good friends with her. Um, and the Till movie that's playing right now, um, the writer for that is Keith Beauchamp. He's from Louisiana, originally from Louisiana, lives in New York. And I uh, met him several years ago, uh, 20, the fall of 2018. He spoke at uh, Florida State University. Florida State University holds all of the archive materials from the Emmett Till trial and uh, many other things related to Emmett Till. And uh, Keith spoke there interviewing two of Emmett's cousins who were, one was 88, one was 84 years old. And they talked about where they were when they found out that their cousin had been murdered. Um, in the audience was a man by the name of Steve Whittaker. And um, I met him at the uh, program and uh, Steve Whittaker probably wrote the first researched paper on the Emmett Till story back in 1963, eight years after Emmett was murdered. Steve was working on his master's degree in political science. And uh, when it came time to write his thesis, his uh, professor said, well, Steve, we know what you're going to write about. You're from Charleston, Mississippi, right near where the Emmett Till case was in Sumner. And so he spent two summers uh, going back to Mississippi. He interviewed 10 of the 12 jurors, the uh, defense and prosecuting attorneys. He interviewed Clarence Strider, the sheriff who oversaw the trial, and uh, several other people. Um, I have access to his thesis. It's around 194 pages and um, very well written with a lot of important information. Going back to Mississippi and, and uh, people finding out that he was writing about Emmett Till, he had a uh, paper on his windshield when he came back stating, uh, we don't want to see you again. Uh, they threatened him and uh, he had a lot of problems in that way. So uh, Steve Whitaker, um, as I said, uh, was uh, uh, one of the catalysts that really got me involved with this also. We know the story of um, Emmett Till basically um, more recently. Um, in 2020, I was involved with a uh, march for George Floyd and people were saying, say his name. And people would say, George Floyd. And some of the people were saying Emmett Till. And afterwards, people were coming up and talking, who's Emmett Till? We never heard of this person. And so I had just gotten back from the Mississippi Delta in January of 2020, where I had a three hour guided tour of all of the Emmett Till historical sites. And I had previously met uh, Steve Whitaker and I was pretty well versed on the story. So I said, if these people don't know, or many people don't know, maybe it's time for somebody to spread the word of who Emmett Till is. So here I am tonight. Gee. Um, William Faulkner um, grew up in Mississippi, um, probably one of the one of the top writers in America. He won, both, he won both the Pulitzer Prize and the Nobel Prize. Some of you perhaps read some of his novels, As I Lay Dying, Absalom, Absalom, The Sound and the Fury. Um, Faulkner was very involved with the Emmett Till case, and uh, I'll show you the quote here. He, this quote came from uh, when he was in Italy on September 9th of 55, just uh, a little over a week after he found out about Emmett, after Emmett was murdered. Um, and it really explains his feelings here of what he thought. Um, this was not published a lot in the Mississippi press because uh, they really didn't maybe agree with what he was saying. 
But Faulkner died in 1962, just seven years after the murder. And uh, if he had lived longer, he certainly would have played a pivotal point in in uh, the discussion and so forth about what happened. A few more uh, quotes here. Um, first one there by Angelo. Um, I like the quote by Mr. Rogers, when you wonder, you're learning. And then I followed that up with my own quote. As we age, we seem to wonder more. We seem to want to know why things are going on, why things are the way they are. How come we weren't told about this earlier? Emmett Till has been in the news a lot in the past uh, year, um, December 2021. The case that was reopened in 2017 was finally closed with no indictments to Carolyn Bryant. Uh, this was opened after Timothy Tyson supposedly interviewed Carolyn Bryant, and um, she admitted that what happened at Bryant's Grocery, um, a lot of it was not true. However, Timothy Tyson never turned his tape recorder on, so he only had written notes. So when they found out about that uh, and interviewed Carolyn, she recanted that and said, no, I never told Timothy Tyson that. Um, I already talked about the mini series here. Some of you perhaps saw that it's still available, I believe, on streaming on Hulu. Um, January, um, Emmett and Mamie received the Congressional Gold Medal Award. Um, the anti-lynching law is passed in March, and that took 120 years to pass. It was introduced for the first time in 1902. Um, they found the original search warrant um, in Greenwood, Mississippi courthouse, and uh, the search warrant was never served to Carolyn Bryant. So they reopened the case again, and uh, 9th of August, 2022, uh, they closed it, and Carolyn was never indicted again. Um, box office movie Till is playing currently. Uh, I returned from Washington, D.C. Monday and spent five days in D.C. and took part in the Till Trilogy. It's a three-part uh, play. Uh, the first one is The Ballad of Emmett Till and The Summer of Emmett Till. And uh, I'll tell you about the discussion afterwards as we get into the program this evening about uh, the lady who was 11 years old in 1955 when Emmett was killed and her grandfather ran Rainer Funeral Home in Chicago where Emmett's body was brought to uh, and uh, so forth and her feelings and what she said, okay? Uh, if you Google Emmett Till, these are probably some of the pictures that you will come up first. Uh, they were taken in December after Christmas by a friend of Mamie Till in 1954. And as you can see, Emmett was a very strikingly handsome young man. He loved to wear a little tie, his hat decked out in his tie, um, and so <coughs> forth. Two terms you have to know if you understand the Emmett Till story. The first one is mores, the sociological term, which means characteristics of a society and the norms and behaviors of a society and what is acceptable in that society, in the social group, what is right and what is wrong. And Jim Crow, term used for the statues that legalized racial segregation from the end of Reconstruction until the mid-20th century. Social mores in the South at the time of Emmett's murder. Um, some of you perhaps saw the movie um, Loving versus, um, uh, I think it's on this one, but uh, Interracial separation between the races was strictly forbidden. All but 16 states had racial marriage until 67, the Supreme Court overturned a landmark case in Loving versus Virginia. If you saw that movie, it's available on um, any of the streaming video channels. 
Um, by 1920, 80% of black people had some white blood. And this is evident by studying Thomas Jefferson, who fostered six children by the enslaved person, Sally Hemings. When you go to Monticello now, they don't detract and not tell this story. It's very out in the open. Um, free Mississippi is also a term that is important in the study of Emmett Till. Basically, what it means is that Mississippi is not going to stand for any outside interference. No one's going to come down here and tell us what to do. We're going to solve our own problems, do whatever we want to do, and uh, stay out of our business. And absolute respect for a white man's wife. All of you probably in your survey courses of high school history saw the cotton gin at one time. The cotton gin actually was developed or made by African-American man. And um, it brought cotton into the largest export in the United States. Um, one pound of cotton holds a half pound of cotton seed. So you can imagine the work that went in to separate the threads and getting the seeds out and so forth. Now with the cotton gin, that was all done automatically. And um, as you can see, 1830s, we processed 500 million pounds of cotton. The seeds in cotton were poisonous and would, could kill you. 20 years ago, a scientist took the poisonous part of the seeds out. And now some countries actually eat the seeds and animals could eat it. Animals, for some reason, were, were not poisoned by the seeds. 1865, we have 4 million enslaved people that are now free, set free by the 13th Amendment. 12 of our 18 presidents were slaveholders, eight during the time that they were president, presidents. The DeWolf family located in Bristol, Rhode Island, um, they brought over in three generation, the Charles and James DeWolf families, over 10,000 enslaved people. Hmm. Katrina Brown, great, great, ancestor of the family made a documentary traces of the trade a story from the deep north i met katrina uh several years ago in grand rapids she was showing going to show the documentary i got there early and standing uh by herself i went up introduced myself and had a nice half hour conversation with her she's a graduate of princeton She's a graduate of the Theological Seminary in um, California. And uh, this was the person who was the producer of the documentary. It's available on YouTube and uh, very well done. Uh, her uncle also wrote a book about this. Uh, Katrina was 28 years old when she found out about her ancestors were so involved with the slave trade that she felt she had to do a forgiveness project, do something that that would be uh, satisfying to her and so forth about the horrors of what her ancestors were involved with. <clears throat> the Memphis riot um, occurred right a year after the um, Civil War ended. The Civil War ended April 1865. The Memphis riot was uh, 1866. And Black federal troops were patrolling uh, Memphis to keep order and so forth. And the former Confederate soldiers, the white soldiers were, they just hated to see people, black people who uh, supposedly won the war that they fought against telling them what to do. So they went ahead and uh, got several people together and uh, had a riot and what left were uh, 46 black and two white people were killed, 75 black people injured, um, and you can read the rest of, of war. The biggest riot in history of, of Memphis, Tennessee. As a result of the riot, we have the 14th Amendment passed by the radical Republicans, which gives citizenship to the black population. Um, we also have many black citizens elected to local, state, and 
national government. Um, as you can see, up to 2,000 black citizens were elected during this time of reconstruction. However, it's not going to last forever, this great racial experiment, because in Clinton, Mississippi, we have another riot. And uh, the sign that designates this was just put up fairly recently. But um, they had about 2,500 black people on the Moss former Moss Plantation, which was destroyed during the Battle of Vicksburg in 1863, getting people ready to uh, vote in the upcoming election. Well, there were people called white liners in the audience, and they went ahead and murdered a few people, and a riot broke out, and uh, White liners from the surrounding area came in and also um, burned down homes and, uh, as it says here, um, had a reign of terror during that time. It really was the end of Reconstruction as the experiment uh, after this in Clinton, um, Mississippi. It's about 10 miles from Jackson, Mississippi. And here's the plaque that was recently put up uh, telling about what happened during the riot. Uh, 1921, in June of 1921, of course, we had the Tulsa riot, and uh, we had several riots that happened during this period. Previous slide, I go back to one second here. Um, disputed election of 1876, no one receives the majority of electoral votes. So it appease the Democrats, federal troops are withdrawn from the South and the president is won by the Republican Rutherford B. Hayes. So, so federal troops were patrolling the South and they were led by who else but General William Tecumseh Sherman and former Confederate General James Longstreet, who was best man at Ulysses S. Grant's wedding. Both of them graduated from West Point. And in 1848, James Longstreet served as Grant's best man in his wedding. And he went ahead because he's from South Carolina. He joined the Confederacy and fought for the Confederate Army, but he was repatriated into the Union Army after the war. And you can imagine now we got Sherman hated he burned everything in the famous March to the Sea. And we have James Longstreet, a former Confederate general, now patrolling to keep things in order in the South. In 1896, the Supreme Court um, passes the famous Plessy versus Ferguson. Homer Plessy in 1892 was trying to board a train in the all-white area of Louisiana. He was only one-eighth black. He was white enough to go sit in the white section, but black enough to get arrested. And so the Supreme Court says you can have separate things, schools, uh, you can have anything, as it says, drinking fountains, transportation, even Bibles in the courtrooms were segregated. Just recently, um, a great nephew of uh, Homer Plessy and the great, great granddaughter of the judge who tried that case um, were able to get the case overturned and exonerate Homer Plessy for what happened. Um, between 1877 and 1950, there were over 4,087 documented lynchings and thousands of undocumented lynchings. The most occurred in Mississippi. There were over, or there were 538 in Mississippi. <clears throat> and here's a little bit of an overview of how easily it was to get lynched. I won't go through all of these. You can read them. I will talk about this one, Charles Atkins. Um, there's an artist in Kalamazoo 
by the name of Murphy Darden. He's 92 years old. And a few years ago at the Kalamazoo Museum, he had his paintings displayed. And behind the curtain, he had a painting of the lynching, the burning alive of 15-year-old Charles Atkins. And it was very difficult to, to view. Matter of fact, I think eventually they asked him not to display it. <clears throat> Back in uh, June of 2018, I uh, visited the Memorial for Peace and Justice located in downtown Montgomery, Alabama. It was open in April of 2018. And there's 800 of these six foot rectangular red iron beams hanging. On the beams, it lists the names and the county and the date of where these lynchings took place. Down here, we have duplicates of these beams, and counties can take these and erect them in their home state counties of where the lynchings took place. Uh, this is on six acres. You start at the top of this hill and you wind down uh, to the bottom, and uh, about halfway down, they've got a large waterfall, and that's in commemoration for the undocumented lynchings. <clears throat> the Mississippi Delta starts up here. We don't have the, uh, just where the pointer is, is where Memphis would be up here. Just southeast of Memphis is Pittsburgh Landing, where the Battle of Shiloh was fought in April 6th and 7th of 1862. Over 24,000 casualties, 13,000 by the Confederate Army and 11,000 by the Union Army. We're going to get to the Battle of Shiloh later in the presentation. I just wanted to point it out now. It's about 200 miles from the beginning here at the top, northern part of the Delta, down to the bottom, about 80, yard, 80 miles wide at the east-west. It's, it's on the west side. We have the second largest river in the United States, the Mississippi. Uh, here we have the Tallahatchie River in the uh, the Yazoo River that uh, flows on the east side of the county, or the uh, Delta. Um, a lot of famous people came from the Delta. Morgan Freeman, uh, the actor. We have uh, Jimmy James Henson from the Muppets. We have um, uh, Elvis Presley just over here in uh, Tupelo, just outside the Delta. Um, we have B.B. King from the home of the blues, born here. This is the most fertile land perhaps anywhere in the world. It's fertile because the Mississippi floods and brings a lot of minerals and so forth to this area. Cotton would grow so high here, it had to be picked sometimes on horseback. <clears throat> There were more millionaires in the Delta at the time of the Civil War than anywhere else in America. And as I said, cotton was the largest exporter. And there was a huge economic difference between the planter class and the working class. And we'll get into that uh, soon. And I talked to you about some of the people that were already born here at the bottom. We're going to talk about these three counties in the Delta, Tallahatchie, Sunflower, and Lafleur counties in the northwest part of the Delta. This is the geography part of the presentation, and I want to point out some important things here as we go through the rest of this story. Money is a town um, where Bryant's Grocery was. And uh, Roy Bryant and his wife Carolyn ran that grocery, and it had about 400 people in, residing in money in 1955. It had a cotton gin factory, a gas station, uh, some uh, juke joints, which we don't speak of juke joints in the north, but they're places that have music and have uh, food and so forth. Um, today, uh, when I was in money in 2020, uh, there's nothing there. I mean, they got a church, a few homes in back of Bryant's Grocery, but all the other businesses are gone. 
three miles going this way uh, west, we are going to have Moses Wright's farmhouse. And that farmhouse is where Emmett was abducted from. Uh, that is where he spent the last few days of his life. He came down there to be with his cousins before school started in uh, the September. And um, that home no longer exists. It was destroyed by a tornado a few years ago. Um, just a little bit further up the road from Moses Wright's house is a church where Moses Wright preached until 1949, but he quit preaching, uh, and didn't preach for after 1949. Um, but uh, in that church is not in good condition. Um, we're going to go over here to Webb, and this is where Mamie Till was born on November 23rd, 1921. She would be 101 years old next week if she was alive. Um, her family left uh, Webb in 1924 when she was three years old and moved up to Argo, Illinois as part of the Great Migration between 1917 and 1970, over 6 million African Americans left the South and moved to the Northeast, the Midwest, and out to California, especially out in Oakland area. Sumner is uh, right um, here. And Sumner is the courthouse that the Emmett Till trial was held. And we'll be talking a lot about that. Um, Tutwiler is the funeral home where Emmett's body was taken, uh, first was taken to a funeral home in Greenwood, then it was sent down to Tutwiler, and it was packed in formaldehyde and sent to uh, Chicago. Um, before that happened, however, um, there was a grave being dug just outside of Moses Wright's uh, farmhouse, and they wanted to bury Emmett immediately and when Mamie found out they were already digging his grave, she said, no, I want his body sent back here. Don't, I don't want my son buried in Mississippi. Charleston here is a town where um, I told you about uh, the man who wrote the, uh, on, who wrote the uh, case for Southern justice, Steve. Um, his stepdad was police chief here, and he claims that uh, Levi Tutite Collins and Henry Lee Loggins, two men that were probably involved with the abduction and the murder of Emmett Till, were housed here during the trial so they would not testify. And... Um, they went to look there to find them and they weren't there. So they must have moved them to another jail in the surrounding area, perhaps. Um, we're going to get over here to Mount Bayou. Mount Bayou was a 100% black community. The land where Mount Bayou is, where the city village was developed, was sold by Jefferson Davis's brother. The president of the Confederacy owned that land and sold it so that there would be a black community that they could operate and do things on their own. We're going to go down here now to Sunflower County, which is completely left out of the Emmett Till story for over 50 years. And we'll be telling you why that was done. Um, down here at Indian Ola is where Carolyn Bryant was born, went to high school. She won a beauty contest here. She changed schools and won another beauty contest, but she was married at 17 to Roy Bryant. Roy Bryant was 21, and uh, she never really finished. Um, we're going to get up here to uh, this town of Drew. Drew uh, was kept out of the Emmett Till story, uh, as I said, for up until 2004. And just going a little bit... Uh, West here, we have a plantation called the Sturdivant Plantation. And uh, the Sturdivant Plantation was uh, purchased 
uh, recent, well, not recently, but 1992 by a dentist by the name of Jeff Andrews. And he purchased that, and uh, we'll show you pictures of it. And no one ever told him that in that plantation barn shed, which I'll show you, is where Emmett Till was tortured and where Emmett Till was murdered. And uh, his wife says, I hear voices when I go outside, I go near the shed. And she says, I believe there are spirits there uh, and so forth. So what I want you to remember here is the money, Mississippi, uh, the Sumner here, Mount Bayou, and down here in Drew and the Sturdivant Plantation. These three counties and Sunflower uh, until the FBI reopened the case in 2004 was left out of the history. Um, this is the setting for uh, the Emmett Till abduction in 1955, taken from the 1950 census. As you can see, it was extremely poor area. Uh, people made very little money, housing and so forth. Um, two thirds of the population was African American. Uh, very little education, as you can see here. Um, and uh, the median annual income of $670, six from the lowest of the 82 counties of the Delta. Black Monday in 1955, we have the famous Brown versus Board of Education. Um, this overturned Plessy versus Ferguson, which is going to allow integration of the schools and um, it sets off a feeling of despair among all the white citizens who grew up with segregation and could not foresee that their white children would ever sit in a classroom next to a black person. It just isn't going to happen. So if we go back to that map that I showed you of where Carolyn Bryant was born in Indianola, we have the White Citizens Council formed a loosely group of white racist people, and it spread throughout the whole state of Mississippi, especially active in the Delta. And they would do anything to stop integration, as we'll talk about. Um, Voting is such an important aspect of our democracy, and I don't think there's one aspect that's been talked about more the last few years than our right and privilege to vote in a democracy. And people lost their lives, as I'm going to talk to you. This is Reverend George Lee, who was taking his clothes his suit from the cleaners to his car and driving home on a Saturday evening and a car pulled up and fired a shotgun blast that knocked his jaw out and had several pellets in his face and he crashed his car in a tree. Uh, his wife demanded an open casket for George and in the investigation they said those pellets were cavities that came out of his face that wasn't part of the shotgun that was fired and so forth. He was trying to register voters and very active in, in that. Just a few weeks here before Evan is murdered, we have Lamar Smith who is registering, voter, registering voters on the courthouse steps and in point-blank range on the courthouse steps, he is shot in front of several witnesses. In both of these cases, there's no indictments, no justice that was ever served. I'm going to tell you this story. Um, I learned this story when I was at the museum in Jackson, Mississippi. And it goes along with the attitudes and the behaviors of many of the Southerners. It happened about 
11, 12 years before Emmett's murder. It happened in Florida. And it didn't get any publicity because it happened in Florida and it was with a Florida boy compared to Emmett coming from Chicago. But Willie Howard worked in a dime store and he sent Christmas cards to all of the fellow workers. He sent one to Cynthia Goff, but he signed it with an L. He followed that up with a note and said that, I know you don't think we're good people, but we really are good people. And I think you're a fine person. And he signed that with an L. Now, Cynthia could have thrown that, that Christmas card and the letter away, but she showed it to her father. Her father got so angered and that a black boy was trying to maybe date his white daughter that he got two workers and they went to uh, the Goth house and abducted in front of his mother, um, Willie Howard. And um, they went to the factory where Willie's dad worked and abducted him and took him to the Swanee Bridge and gave him the option of being shot or tied up and thrown in the river. He took the option of being tied up and he was found the next day on the, in the river. The parents moved out of uh, this area and moved up to uh, Orlando after the murder. This is probably one of my favorite pictures of uh, Emma. He's probably a year old. Mamie here is probably 19 um, years old or so. Um, Emmett had polio when he was very young. He, had, he stuttered, and sometimes when he stuttered, he would, a whistle sometimes would come out and so forth. Um, his mother um, was a very um, educated person. Um, she had an all-A report card at Argo High School, one of the only uh, black uh, students that ever had an all A report card. She was one of the first uh, of four black students to graduate from Argo High School. She spent 23 years as a teacher and um, also did a lot of public speaking after Emmett's uh, death. Now, I had to put a picture of myself here. Um, both of us are 13 years old, probably, both in eighth grade. And um, I put this in here to give you a description of what Mamie told her son before they left to visit their great uncle in Mississippi. Mamie was from Mississippi. She had visited it the last time, 1949. And um, she told Emma, you're going to a place where you got to behave. When you are walking down the street and a white person comes walking toward you, you leave the sidewalk and you bow your head. You say, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, to any white person. And you kind of act invisible around white people. You don't want to create any suspicions or anything like that. Now, if I went to Mississippi, my mother wouldn't have had to give me that lecture. It would have been, Jim, have a great time. Behave yourself. Now, this is Bryant's Grocery as it looked in 1955. Um, on the 24th of August, um, we're going to go back to the 20th of August on Sunday when Emma arrived from Chicago. Monday the 21st, they were actually the 22nd, he arrived on the 21st. They were picking cotton and halfway through the day, Emma said, I'm not picking any more cotton. I mean, it's 95 degrees. I'm a city boy from Chicago and you can pick cotton, but I'm going to go back and take a siesta or rest or whatever. 
Anyways, um, on the evening of the 24th, uh, Emmett's cousins and a couple of neighbors got in Moses's 46 Ford and they went into money and they were going to go to a juke place. However, the juke place was closed. So they see people playing checkers here. And so they stop. Eunice Wright, uh, Emmett's cousin, who was 16 years old, was the driver. And he said, got out of the car and looked at the um, looked at the uh, checkers and so forth. And they were only here for 15 or 20 minutes. And what transpired here in that short time, as many debates, as many different people um, have given different interpretations. I'm going to tell you what I've learned and what I believe maybe happened and is taken from Debbie Anderson's book is that somebody told Emmett that there's this beautiful young female inside Bryant's grocery. You got to go inside and see her. Emmett, Emmett was a very vivacious, joking person. He loved people and he loved laughter and he even paid people to tell him jokes. And, uh, I'm sure he would have said, oh, yeah, I've been with white people before. I can go in there and see this girl. But he went in, but he did not know that Carolyn Bryant was married. He didn't know how old she was. He may have thought when he looked at her, she was not 21. She was 18 or 17 or whatever. She was much younger. Now, in the Till movie, when it shows Emmett going into Bryant's grocery, the first things he says to Carol is, you look like an actress. And then he pulls out his billfold and he shows Carolyn a picture of a white lady. Now, supposedly he did have a picture of a white lady in his billfold. And in the Till movie, it shows him when he purchased his billfold, he went and purchased a white picture also. What other transpired there? He may have said something to her. He may have violated the principles of not touching the skin of a white person by giving the money in her hand. When he left, he waved goodbye and he was escorted out with his cousin, Simeon Wright, who was 12 years old, two years younger, and Carolyn followed them out. When they got out on the steps of the store and Carolyn kept walking, Emmett came up with the famous, <whistles> and oh my God, all the cousins panicked. They said, we gotta leave immediately. That is a violation of the principles that we never would whistle at a white woman. Carolyn Bryant supposedly was going to get a gun under the under the seat of her sister-in-law's car, and that's shown in the Till movie. They take off, and they're driving down Dark Fear Road back to the farmhouse, and about halfway back, they notice there's lights coming at them. They stop and take off, and they go into the cotton fields and hide, and fortunately, the car passes back and doesn't stop. <clears throat> and Wheeler Parker interviewed, or Debbie Anderson interviewed Wheeler Parker uh, four times, and he kind of says that uh, Emmett was coaxed into going into the store to see Carolyn Bryant. <clears throat> now, Roy Bryant um, was away during this time in Texas. And he gets back on Friday, the 26th of August. And um, supposedly, there's a Judas that tells him, do you know what happened in Bryant's grocery? There was a black boy came in and he whistled at your wife. Both Bryant and J.W. Milam, his half-brother, there were five Milams and six 
Bryant's. Their mother divorced and uh, married a Bryant, and they had six more kids, more children. When I talked to Steve Whitaker about this, uh, Steve said, Jim, they both were Peckerwoods. I said, Steve, Peckerwoods, we don't use that term in the North. He said, Jim, they were rednecks. They were mean, obnoxious. No one liked them in the Delta. And they were very vindictive characters. So on Saturday, um, somebody comes in, uh, a black boy comes into the store and Roy Bryan is there on the 27th of uh, August. And uh, Carolyn is there and uh, right away, Roy Bryant thinks that must be the boy from Chicago or something like that. He even stomps on his foot and so forth. And his mother intervened and Carolyn said, no, that's not the boy. A little while later, they get into J.W. Milam's 1955 green and white pickup, which he purchased on Wednesday, August 24th, the day that Emmett did the famous whistle. And um, they go looking for the boy from Chicago. And there's a boy walking down the street and they captured him and put him in the back of the pickup and Carolyn Bryant said, no, that's not the boy from Chicago. And they throw him out and a couple of his teeth were uh, knocked out. <clears throat> Evening of the 27th was a happy time for, Mo, for uh, Emma, him and his cousins take off. They go into Greenwood, they have a good time. Uh, they're going to juke places, maybe indulging in a little bit of alcohol um, and partying. And they get home around midnight um, from Greenwood. <clears throat> this is the home of Moses Wright. And around 2.30 in the morning, we have the 55 pick up, arrive, and two men get out with flashlights, and J.W. has his Colt World War II pistol, Colt 45. It weighs 2.3 uh, pounds and uh, was his uh, revolver from World War II where he won the Purple Heart and Silver Star for bravery. Um, and he served, I believe, under George Patton in World War II. Preacher, preacher, we want the boy from Chicago. They knocked on the door. And Moses Wright came to the door and um, opened it. And it was pitch black. The moon wasn't out. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. And they got the flashlights. And they say, we want the boy from Chicago. So they go searching in the bedrooms. And they went into Wheeler Parker's bedroom first. And he said he was shaking so bad. He said... When he thinks about it, sometimes he still shakes. He's 82 years old. They finally got into the bedroom where Emmett was sleeping with his cousin, Simeon Wright, and they make him get dressed. And, um, and Emmett doesn't say yes, sir, to him. And they say, if you don't say yes, sir, to us, we're going to blow your head off. And uh, they escort him out. And um, when they're going out, Moses Wright thinks he hears a female voice, maybe. And they ask him, is this the boy? And uh, they say, yes, it is. So Carolyn Bryant possibly was with them in the abduction, but we don't know for sure. There also was a black man standing here. And uh, that could have been one of the worker, black workers who worked for J.W. Milam. It could have been uh, Henry Lee Loggins or Levi Tutite Collins. Now, after the abduction, if Carolyn Bryant was with them, they went back to Bryant's grocery and dropped her off. If Carolyn was not in the car, in the truck, they went back to Bryant's grocery and asked her if this was Emmett. They also um, went back to Glendora where JW lived and roughed up Emmett a while then supposedly they took off from uh, Glendora and they drove 
75 miles to this spot, Rosedale, on the Mississippi River. There was a 100-foot cliff there, and they wanted to scare Emmett. Now, it's pitch black, and uh, 75 miles takes probably took a while to drive on a two-lane road. Then supposedly, they drove all the way back to Glendora and in the uh, shed of uh, JW is where Emmett was tortured and murdered. This was what was believed for 50 years. <clears throat> Now, three days after Emmett is murdered on August 31st, a 17-year-old boy by the name of Floyd Hodges is fishing, and he noticed two feet sticking up in the Tallahatchie River. He calls his dad. His dad calls the sheriff, and they take two rowboats out to the river, and they bring Emmett back to the shore. Emmett... Uh, had a 75 pound cotton gin fan wrapped in barbed wire around him to weight him down. He weighed about 250 pounds from being in the water for three days. And uh, he was very hard obviously to recognize for the torture that he endured. Uh, Clarence Strider, the sheriff is sent there and Moses Wright is there to help identify. And it was perhaps easy to identify, even if the face was badly unrecognizable, because before Emmett left for Mississippi, he was given his father's ring, Louis Till. And uh, he wore that proudly. And um, right away, uh, Moses Wright said, yeah, that's Emmett. I mean, who else would have the ring LT on it? Um, this cotton gin fan was in the courthouse up until they remodeled it in the 70s and it was put out in the street and taken and no one knows whatever happened to it. Brian is arrived, arrested in the afternoon of the 28th. And the next day, J.W. Milam comes to the courthouse in Greenwood and he turns himself in. They admit that they kidnapped him, but they let him go. The great mystery is what happened between the time of the abduction until 6.30 a.m. when three key witnesses see the 55 pickup go to the Sturdivant Plantation and um, four men are in the pickup probably Elmer Kimball, who lived next door to J.W. Milam, possibly Melvin Campbell, a brother-in-law of J.W. Milam, or Eddie Milam, who was a brother of J.W. And there were four black people uh, in the back, three besides Emmett Till, uh, one of them could have been Osa Johnson, um, Henry Lee Loggins, Levi Tutite Collins. They all denied that they were there uh, during this time after questioning. <clears throat> now, this is the shed that uh, the pickup truck backed up into and took Emmett out into. And... Um, where the torture began. At one point, um, Willie Reed was walking. Now there's a bayou in front of this area here. As I stood in front of the bayou, we don't call bayous, we call them ditches, I think here. <laughs> but anyways, um, standing here I was, and you can look out at the uh, where the uh, shed is and so forth. But Willie Reed was walking to Drew in the morning and uh, he saw the pickup truck back in here and he stayed there and he heard the beating and the, and the moaning and the screaming of Emmett. And he saw J.W. Milam leave here and go to this uh, water pump and, pick, and drink some water here. And he saw the Colt 45 stuffed into his side. 
he was an eyewitness. Mandy Bradley, who was living in a house there, also witnessed it. And another gentleman by the name of Walter um, Billingsley also uh, witnessed it, as well as Frank Young. Frank Young will go to Mount Bayou and he will talk to Dr. T.R.M. Howard, uh, where the black press is going to be staying during the um, trial and where Mamie stayed during the trial, and Mamie's uh, father, John Carthen. And he tells that there's witnesses that actually saw what took place. They didn't actually see the beating, but they saw J.W. and so forth. And here's the barn as it looks today. Uh, the shed right here. Dr. Andrews, uh, if you want to read a good article, uh, his name was Emmett Till, published September 2021 in the Atlantic Magazine. Um, uh, just excellent article um, about many of the things that he found out about this property. They want to make it into a national park eventually and so forth, even if they have to take the shed away and put it somewhere else or whatever. But he's very obliging, Dr. Andrews. Uh, when I was there, you can go on his property and so forth. His house is just this side there. It's got a swimming pool and, and so forth. Um, Emmett's body, as I said, was brought back to Chicago and it was in a pine box and stamped on the top of it was do not open under any circumstances, basically. She pleaded with the funeral director to open it. And uh, when I was in D.C., I met the great or the granddaughter of Mr. Rayner, who spoke after the uh, one or what the play of uh, the ballad of Emmett Till last Friday night. And uh, she was 11 years old. Her mother would not let her view the body. And she said her father, once uh, he um, dressed the body up to be shown and so forth, he never, ever spoke about it again. Uh, there's fourth generation family running Rainer Funeral Home in Chicago. They have two funeral parlors uh, still active today. Uh, this is a picture of Mamie and her boyfriend that she was dating at the time, Jean Mobley. She got married two years after Emmett was buried in 1957. They were married 43 years. He recognized Emmett right away because he gave Emmett a haircut two weeks before he left for Mississippi. Um, Emmett was wrapped in a white sheet and uh, he was no clothes on him and they took it off and he went through and looked at her whole body by herself. Uh, she wanted to do that, a very brave, brave person. Um, this is a picture of the viewing. There's a glass top over the cat, over the casket and over close to 100,000 people uh, in four days of showing uh, viewed Emmett's body. And they want to make this church into a national park as well. Um, <clears throat> the trial of Emmett Till opens on Monday, September 19th, 1955. The first two days are picking a jury. Women were not allowed in the jury. Um, they agreed blacks would not serve on the jury, so we have an all-white jury. And the prosecutors decided they wanted to have people who did not know Milam or Bryant. So they picked people from the hill country of Tallahatchie County, which probably was a mistake because they were lower class white people who were competing for jobs with black people and they were more prejudiced. Um, instead of getting people from the planter class. This man is 26 year old Ray Tibble and we're going to talk about him later in the presentation. The black press um, initially were not given any tables to sit on. They had to stand in the back. And finally, the judge Swango relented and gave them tables and so forth. Um, this trial was probably the biggest trial of the 20th century, up and even maybe surpassing the Lindbergh trial. 
we have uh, John Chancellor covering it, who later became NBC anchor on the nightly news. We have James Kilgallen, who's uh, covered the Lindbergh trial in 1935, whose daughter, Dorothy Kilgallen, was a star on the popular quiz show, What's My Line? Um, and we have several other writers who went on and did great things in journalism that covered this trial as well. We have people from foreign countries. We have people from Great Britain as well. Um, this is the courthouse as it looked, as it was obviously in 1955. It was remodeled in the 70s and they changed a lot of it, the windows and so forth. And I don't know if they did that because they didn't want people coming there and going back and remembering the trial or what. But in 2018, it was all redone through special grants. And today, when I was there, it looks just like it did in 1955. And unbeknownst to me, it's still used as an active courtroom. Um, James Hicks is an African-American writer, and uh, he's at a funeral on Sunday, the 18th, the day before the trial starts. And um, he's told by a woman that I know that there's two African-American or two black men that were involved in the abduction. And if you go to this juke place in Glendora, the lady is there. So he gives a description. She gives a description of the lady and the, he finds out who she is. They share a few drinks and he says, yeah, they're um, housed in the Charleston jail, I believe. And so uh, that's when they decided to go to Charleston jail looking for him, and they already had been moved. <clears throat> this is just a picture of the county and where the uh, jurors came from. Nine of the jurors were farmers. Uh, I believe there was one salesperson and two people that were one a carpenter and one a manual laborer. Um, the courthouse here um, and this statue um, is about 40 feet tall. It was put up in 1915 by the Daughters of the Confederacy to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the ending of the Civil War. And on the bottom of it, it says, Our Heroes. And uh, there's several of those statues located throughout the South that still still exist. This is the Delta Inn that the jury was sequestered in. On the third night of the trial, there was a, a cross that was burned in front of it. A lot of notes were smuggled in by the Citizens Council to the jurors. If you don't come up with an acquittal, uh, bad things can happen to you and so forth. <clears throat> this uh, Delta Inn had a sign up uh, uh, commemorating that it was part of the trial and so forth. The owner of the inn ripped it out and they put another one up. He got so frustrated he tore the inn down. Um, as I said, I, I told you about looking for the men of uh, Collins and Loggins. Um, there's also other people that uh, were eyewitnesses that are found and that will testify on the third day of the trial. Clarence Strider, uh, he owned a large plantation. Uh, he had six tenement houses and on the roof of each house spelled his name S-T-R-I-D-E-R. -E um, he initially kind of went th for the prosecution and kind of the first few days thought this body was probably Emmett's and so forth. However, he got threatening death threats and he changed his whole attitude stating this body was not Emmett, it was not a black person either and so forth. The idea that they have Emmett's body as far as coming from the river that was the one that was murdered now is the thrust of the whole trial. They don't have the right body. Now, if you are anybody that 
is an attorney in certainly if a body is taken out and it's got LT on a ring, um, circumstantial maybe, but boy, hard to disprove. You'd have to find somebody and steal that ring and put it on their body and so forth. This is Willie Reed here. Uh, he's 18 years old and he testified um, during the trial as well as Mandy Bradley and Ed Reed, his dad. Um, his testimony was truthful, but the defense attorneys got them all flustered and mixed up. And he didn't understand yards of how far away he was from the shed, how far away he was from J.W. Milam when he came out of the shed and so forth. And um, he really uh, left uh, Mississippi under death threats and got up to Chicago and had a nervous breakdown. Uh, this is a picture of John Carthen who went with Mamie to the trial. Um, this is uh, Walter um, Bellingsley who testified in the trial. This is Con or Dr. T.R.M. Howard, John Diggs, Congressman from Detroit, and Mandy Bradley. Probably one of the most famous things in courtroom history in America is the Moses Wright pointing out the two defendants, J.W. Milam and Roy Bryant. Um, black people did testify against whites. It was unheard of. And he had the courage when asked, are the two defendants that are the two people who kidnapped Emmett here in the court, uh, courtroom, and he stood up and said, there they are. And um, they want to make a statue of this and put it in front of the courtroom eventually. Man, he's lucky he's alive. Yeah, he, uh, he went back and he had to sleep away from his house and he left and uh, under um, very dangerous circumstances, left Mississippi, left his car there, and, uh, and uh, escaped. His wife, Elizabeth, uh, left the house the night of the kidnapping, and she never went back. She left and went, back, went to Chicago. Uh, on the fourth day of the trial, um, Carolyn Bryant is going to testify in on September 9th, she meets with her attorneys and gives a story of what happened. And that story was that uh, this black boy from Chicago came in and touched her skin and uh, flirted with her and so forth. On the trial, they came up with a totally different story that Emma came across the counter and grabbed her around the waist and said, I've been with white women before. Don't you want to date me and so forth? And more like an assault. That was published in the Mississippi press. And we'll talk about that as it goes on. Um, initially, the Mississippi press came out in favor of the prosecution. However, Roy Wilkins, who was the head of the NAACP in Chicago, said the whole state of Mississippi is going to pay for this murder of a 14-year-old boy. Now, go back to what I told you about free Mississippi. They don't want people telling them that the whole state is bad and so forth. So the press turns in favor of the uh, defendants. And all of many of the papers now are coming out with articles supporting uh, Bryant and Milam, and um, they're praising Carolyn Bryant as this beauty queen and so forth. They're calling Emmett Plumpy and so forth, and uh, they're actually uh, even saying some things, derogatory things about Mamie Till. Um, Mamie didn't want to be in the courtroom during the verdict. She left and drove back to Mount Bayou, but on the way on the radio, she heard that the defendants were acquitted, and you can see it's like they just won the trifecta, smoking cigars, and so forth. 
On October 25th, 1955, a man by the name of William Bradford Huey, he will contact two of the five defense attorneys, J.J. Braylon and John Witten, and offer them $1,000 each if they will get Milam and Bryant together and um, tell the story of what really happened. And over a bottle of whiskey in Braylon's, John Witten's uh, office, they sit down and tell a story that was probably made up a lot by Witten and uh, Braylon about what happened. And that was published in January of 1956 and stood as the truth until, 19, until 2004 when the case was reopened. And um, really a slap in the face to the Till family after they were acquitted. They were given $3,100. And um, soon after the acquittal, the black people uh, that patronized Bryant's Grocery wouldn't go there, and therefore the store soon closed, and they were desperate for money. And uh, JW's 55 Chevy pickup was going to be repossessed, so $3,100 that they split was enough to pay off the uh, pickup truck. This is available if you want to read it online um, or I can send it to you. Um, as I mentioned before, um, going here um, in LaFleur County and driving all the way to the Mississippi and then back, there wasn't time for that. Um, Ellen Witten, who was the granddaughter of John Witten, the defense attorney, published a master's thesis that said there wasn't time for the trip from Glendora to the Mississippi and then back, and then to be seen at the Sturdivant Plantation at 6.30 a.m. And uh, therefore, along with Stanley Nelson, who made a documentary in 2003, in Keith Beauchamp's documentary in 2004, they were able to get the FBI to reopen the case led by Agent Dale Ellinger. Um, Dale Ellinger spent 18 months investigating it and um, interviewed several hundred witnesses and people. And uh, Joyce Childs was the uh, Attorney General, and she was a black female Attorney General, and uh, they failed to indict anyone during that investigation. Now, we got the uh, trial in November, or the grand jury investigation, about the kidnapping. So Mamie Till and her father returned, along with Willie Reed, to testify during the grand jury investigation of the kidnapping, which Emmett and are with uh, Roy Bryant and J.W. admitted when they were arrested. Senator Eastland uh, gets the records of Lewis Till, the Army records, which were sealed and confidential. And he has the papers in Mississippi publish those records. And what those records said was that Lewis Till in 1944, raped two women and killed one woman. He was convicted, and on July 4th, 1945, he was hung. And he is buried in a World War I cemetery, Osi Asni, where there's 96 people murdered or that were um, convicted of crimes during World War II that are buried, and they're only buried with a number. Now, this man, John Edgar Weidman, has researched this and said that Lewis Till was railroaded through the tr military trial and very well could be innocent. There were no witnesses to this. However, when the news broke that 
Lewis Till raped two women and so forth. The grand jury investigating the kidnapping case dropped it. They said, like father, like son, or son like father, about what happened. No justice. I brought this into the program this evening because it's on the Emmett Till Historical Trail. Elmer Kimmel, as I said, was 26 years old here. And he lived next to JW, and he went into the gas station to fill JW's pickup up truck with some gas, but he didn't want a full tank. Clinton Melton was the gas station attendant, and he didn't know how much gas he wanted, so he went ahead and filled it up. And Elmer became very irritated, said, I'm going to come back and murder you. Sure enough, he comes back with a shotgun and shoots Clinton in front of the gas station owner. Uh, Elmer went to trial in Sumner, the same place that Emmett's trial was held. And uh, he too was acquitted of cold-blooded murder. Um, I talked to you about Ellen Witten already and how, this, how the FBI reopened the case <clears throat> and how it was after 18 months it was closed. Um, several murders occur here in the early 60s that um, are worth mentioning in the civil rights struggle that went what happened after Emmett's death. Um, Medgar Evers attended the every day of the trial. He worked for Dr. T.R.M. Howard out of college. He wanted to get into law school, but he was rejected three times. So he became head of the NAACP in Jackson, Mississippi. He was working to register voters. And on June 12th, getting out of his car at his residence, he was shot in the back. Um, the man who shot him uh, basically was free uh, up until uh, he was finally tried in 1994, 31 years after the murder, and uh, was convicted. Um, probably the one of the most famous cases that brought about the 64-65 Civil Rights Act was the bombing of the 16th Avenue Baptist Church in Birmingham, the four young girls. Three of the girls were um, um, three of the girls were 14 and one was uh, nine years old. The only way they could identify um, uh, the one girl by the name of um, Eddie Mae Collins was by her shoes because she was decapitated during the bombing. Um, the men involved with this belonged to a very uh, strict uh, white supremacy group, and it took years for them to get charged and convicted. Uh, Mississippi burning the James Cheney um, story uh, by James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner were trying to help uh, students in Mississippi, and uh, they were a part of the uh, uh, summer of uh, 64, where students were brought into Mississippi to tutor black students and uh, do other things to help them. And uh, the Ku Klux Klan had 93,000 uh, members in Mississippi in 1964, uh, more 3,000 less than the largest city of Jackson had. And they had a subgroup where they would uh, maybe harass somebody or do dirty deeds to somebody. But the last objective to carry out was murder. And uh, that was what happened to uh, these three gentlemen. They were just came from Miami of Ohio where they, these students went to get instructions as far as how they were going to work in Mississippi and so forth. And it was only a few days that they were in Mississippi before they were murdered. 
Edgar Ray Killen was sentenced to 60 years in prison, and, but he wasn't tried and convicted until 2005. Uh, the only female that was uh, convicted or uh, was um, killed during the civil rights struggle was from Detroit, Viola Greg Rioso. She was taking a 18 year old black boy back home after the Selma to Montgomery march. And uh, Vernon Dahmer uh, was murdered in 1966 in Hattiesburg, Mississippi by the KKK. He was actively involved with registering voters. And um, he um, house was torched with 12 gallons of gasoline. And pictures of uh, Evers, uh, the Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner, uh, Vernon Dahmer, and the three young girls. Um, this person uh, investigated these murders by the name of Jerry Mitchell. And this book was published two years ago about all of his work and so forth that he did called Race Against Time. If you want to read a suspenseful book, it's uh, worth, worth reading. Uh, when they were investigating the murders of the three civil rights workers, they were scouring the rivers and they found 22 other black bodies. And one of the Till scholars came out with this book, uh, by Davis Hope from Florida State University, and it tells what some, who they finally identified some of these bodies and so forth. Emmett Till Unsigned Civil Rights Case came out and uh, where people could be uh, tried. Uh, there was no statute of limitations and so forth. People committing violent crimes against African Americans. Um, we have the uh, Emmett Till Commission formed in Sumner, um, made up of nine black, nine white people. Gordon Little uh, was one of the people who organized the commission, and they felt they should do something to apologize to the Emmett Till family of what happened in their community to a 14-year-old boy. Gordon Little was in the service in the 70s, and he was stationed in Germany, and his first sergeant came up to him and said, oh, Gordon, you're from that town down there in Sumner where that boy from Chicago was murdered. By the name of Emmett Till. He looked at First Sergeant and he says, uh, I never heard of Emmett Till. It was all swept under the rug. The Chicago Defender newspaper was forbidden down in Mississippi and um, it was hush hush basically. So on the courthouse steps of October 2nd, 2007, the apology is written, is given. Probably if you go to that hot button. Apologize for this. Is there, a, is there a way to turn the volume up? Well, it should be coming out through the PowerPoint. That's the.
just wonder. Do you have the voice to it? I don't know, I can't imagine what he went through back then. Well, I, all I know is what I saw on television, read in the newspaper. Probably one I died for Jenny by standing here today that was here and had himself sent to Joy. <laughs> OJ is going to sign All right. But uh, I've got a resolution wrote up, and I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to tell you we apologize. We're sorry for what happened. I didn't do it. I, I was just reading my mom did his heart. Man. But, but, but I know I know how you feel. It's so sort of strange uh, how this is coming about, son. Ten years ago, yesterday, that one right there. Thank you very much for supervising. We move on. We don't want to spend. All of the day right at this spot, even though it is Hallett Brown. We next will have hear from the co-chairman, uh, the mayor of Turkwell, Mississippi, Mayor Grayson, and Ms. Pierce, co-chairman of this commission. Come forward, please. Let's give them a round of applause. She's 81 years old. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And it did give me a great pleasure today to stand here before you and attempt to read uh, the resolution, the first resolution. And if I may at this time, the resolution is read as follows. We, the citizens of Tallahatchie County, believe that racial reconciliation began with telling the truth. We call on the state of Mississippi all its citizens in every county to begin an honest investigation into our history. While it would be painful, it is necessary recognizing the potential for division and violence in our own town. We pledge to each other, black and white, to move forward together on the healing, the wound of the past, and in ensuring justice for all of our citizens. Thank you. Before the trial began, Till's mother had sought assistance from federal officials under the terms of the so-called Lindbergh Law, which made kidnapping a federal crime, but she had received no aid. Only a renewed request in December 2002 from Till's mother, supported by Mississippi District Attorney Joyce Childs and the Emmett Till Justice Campaign, yielded a new investigation. We, the citizens of Tallahatchie County, recognize that the Emmett Till case was a terrible miscarriage of justice. We state candidly and with deep regret failure to effectively pursue justice. We wish to say to the family of, Emily, of Emmett Till that we are profoundly sorry for what was done in this community to your loved one. We, the citizens of Tallahatchie County, acknowledge the horrific nature of this crime. Its legacy has haunted our community. We need to understand the system that encouraged these events and others like them to occur so that we can ensure that it never happen again. Working together, we have the power now to fulfill the promise of liberty and justice for all. This was signed by the members of the Emmett Till Memorial Commission, Bobby Banks, Martha Ann Clark, Mary Tucker Croft, Robert Grayson, Jesse M. James, Jerome Little, Frank Mitchner, Judith Mitchner, Robert Parker, Eddie Pearson, Syke Sturdivant, Johnny B. Thomas, Carolyn Webb, and John Wilshe. Thank you.
Sorry, I lost your place, Jim. Yeah. We just hit the 90 minute mark. So I oh. need to get folks out of here oh, before eight. Okay. <laughs> well, um, so you want to wrap it up then, kind of? Well, it, yeah, in the next 10 minutes or so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Courthouse as it look as it looks today. Um, <clears throat> this is the Bro Roy's uh, Bryant uh, gas station, and uh, this was remodeled uh, by the family of Ray Tibble, uh, who was on the jury, and they got a grant to remodel this. It stands 70 feet from Bryant's Grocery. This is Bryant's Grocery as it looks today. The roof came off by Hurricane Katrina, and it's barely standing. Um, they got a grant to do this because they said black and white folks back in the 50s congregated here listening to music, and that really wasn't true. They were hoping that the Tibble family would renovate this, and they never did. They wanted $40 million to purchase it to make it into a museum, and they lowered it now to $4 million. That's another picture there. Uh, talked to you about this already about Carolyn Bryant. <clears throat> picture of uh, 94 days after uh, Emmett's uh, murder, um, Rosa Parks fails to give up her seat in Montgomery, and we start the 13 month boycott led by. Martin Luther King. She said she did it because of what happened to Emmett Till. And then we have several other things, the Greenboro sit-in, Freedom Riders to uh, desegregate the bus depots, James Meredith, first black uh, person to enter Old Miss. Um, and then we have the 65, 64-65 Civil Rights Acts. A picture of James Meredith. James Meredith lives in Jackson, Mississippi. He's 82 years old or 83 um, in the integration of the lunch counters that spread throughout the country. Uh, this is a book coming out about Clyde Kennard written by the Debbie Anderson. He served in World War, he served in the Korean War and uh, went back to Mississippi and he tried to get into Southern University, and he was denied six times. They got tired of him applying, so they falsely arrested him and put him into jail, and he got uh, colon cancer, and they never gave him any treatments. The title of the book is The Long, Slow Lynching of Clyde Kennard. You can see the hatred of the kids there at the young 15-year-old student integrating Little Rock School. And this happened in Anniston, Alabama, the Freedom Riders, the bus that was torched. I met uh, this person here, Miller Green, uh, several years ago, and he gave a lecture about integrating the bus depot in Jackson, Mississippi. He was 18 years old, and he um, was offered $50 to sit in the white-only section, and he was arrested and put in solitary confinement at the Jackson State Penitentiary. June, July, August, he was let out in September. Okay, we can play this video. That's good. Yeah. Um, actually, that one looks like it's going to play for you. Okay. My great grandfather and I were in Anniston a week. Before that happened, oh. he was a uh, promoter of uh, getting people to vote. I too give honor to God, who is the source of my strength and the reason for my being. In 1955, when my only child was killed, 
It seemed that there was nothing for me to live for. I wanted to die. But in the midst of that planning, the Lord spoke to me. And he told me not to spend my time hating the perpetrators of the crime because they would not even know that I was hating them. And the things that would be released into my body would eventually destroy me. And while I was pondering that statement, another thing came, another uh, something was spoken to me, and that something was, I am the ruler of heaven and earth. I see all things. I'm commissioning you to go into the vineyard and work. And what is right, I will pay. And don't forget that vengeance is mine. And a wonderful thing happened to me. It seemed like someone took a giant eraser and my mind had become a chalkboard and everything, all memories of Mr. Milam and Mr. Bryant were erased from my thoughts. I was able to go out into the vineyard and work, which I'd been commissioned to do. And that work turned out to be training boys and girls to do Dr. King's speeches. I can truthfully say that for 47 years, I have not wasted any time hating Milam and Bryant. They became inconsequential so far as I was concerned. It was as if they didn't even exist. And since I have had time to think things over, I don't want anyone dead. And even the people that are proven guilty, and these two men did confess of their foul deed, but even so, I do not wish the, I, I don't have the balance of life and death in my hands that was entrusted to God himself. He sends us here, he takes us away. I do know that from time to time, I've heard rumors of Milam and Brian. I know that both of them lost two sons each because they were married to two women and those two women, their little sons were about the same age, four down. And they did not have the pleasure of spending their lives with their sons. And I do know that they thought they were heroes, but when their backers backed up and would not support them, they spent a very miserable life wondering, we are the heroes and all of a sudden we are nobody. So I'm sure that they paid, they're both deceased now, but I am sure that they paid for their error. But another thing I know, they never uh, confessed repentance. They never regretted what they had done. In fact, in a three-way conversation with Brian, he said he would do the same thing over again, and not only to Emmett Till, but to whoever got in his way. So I think, I really, I felt sorry for him that he did not have a, a, a spiritual life. And I just wonder where he thought he was going to spend eternity or if he thought he was going to be here forever. Because there's one uh, sentence that you cannot escape, and that is when you go before the judgment seat of God, he will give the verdict. And I am glad that he took hatred out of my heart and had me to go on with my life, speaking whenever someone called on me to speak, and then I went to school, became a teacher. And I, uh, believe me, when you're dealing with children all day, you have so many problems or they have so many problems 
that you are trying to help them resolve until it doesn't leave time for self-pity or dwelling in the past. You've got to be in the future and jumping ahead as fast as you can to help those that you're trying to take along to higher heights and deeper depths in knowledge and in the fear of God. Thank you. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I, 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 we've been here a long time, folks. I apologize for the difficulty there. There's a last video with a short minute and a half from the Smithsonian about the sign that was displayed there and dedicated September 2nd, 2021, that has 173 bullet holes in it. And Wheeler Parker talks in that. Um, I appreciate your patience and uh, uh, I hope uh, my job has transferred the importance of, of lessening hatred in our society and that we can come together and respect each other. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. If anybody has any questions, uh, feel free. Um, I was telling you about uh, my great grandfather and I were 